binary stars are typically very similar, especially in chemical composition and age. But in the binary pair named HD 148937, one star appears younger and, unlike the other, is magnetic. New data from the European Southern Observatory suggests that there were originally three stars in the system until two of them clashed and merged. This violent event created the surrounding cloud and changed both remaining stars. Abigail Frost, an astronomer at European Southern Observatory in Chile, researched this HD 148937, which is located about 3,800 light years away from the Earth in the direction of the constellation Norma. It is made up of two stars, both much more massive than the Sun. They're also surrounded by a huge bilobed nebula of gas called the Dragon's Egg. Frost wanted to investigate it because it's quite rare for a nebula to surround two massive stars. Frost and her team worked for about nine years using ESO's very large telescope interferometer located down in Chile in the Atacama Desert. They also used archival data from the European Southern Observatory's La Silla Observatory. It's really good to work at the dome. HD 148937 is classified as an OFP star, meaning it's a peculiar O star with anomalous emission lines. Her team noticed something really interesting. The width of the H-alpha emission line in the optical spectra was obtained by previous astronomers showed changes over about seven days. This variability suggested that there was a dipolar magnetic field constraining some stellar wind. The previous measurements of the star's magnetosphere led to an estimated strength of about a thousand gauss. By comparison, the sun's magnetic field is one gauss. The large nebula is also rich in carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. Next, the team's interferometric observation revealed a greater detail of the binary's properties. The two stars have nearly the same brightness in the near-infrared spectrum. Older studies couldn't determine between two possible orbital periods for the binary, either 18 years or 26 years, with corresponding eccentricities of about 0.6 and 0.75. Frost's infrared spectroscopy over nine years showed that both stars in the binary are O-type stars, but only one of them showed evidence of a magnetically confined stellar wind, characteristically shown through the strong Balmer emission line. Further, her team's data linked the strong infrared hydrogen emission line to the primary, that is the more massive star, not the secondary. It is this emission that indicates stellar winds, which are held in place by a magnetic field. The technique is often used to identify magnetospheres in hot stars. With this long-term interferometric data, the team figured out the positions of both stars at 10 different points in their orbit. So let's look at their critical interferometric data. The two stars themselves can't be resolved, so their orbits need to be determined from the changes in the spectra. Here we see the orbital model fitted to the interferometric radial velocity data. Blue and red circles represent data for the primary and secondary stars, respectively, and the dashed lines correspond to the model for each star following that same color code. Note that the data points between phases 0.9 and 1.2 are the same as those between 0.9 and 0.2. This is just to make it easier to see. By fitting the orbital model to this data and combining it with the radial velocity info from the previous astronomer studies, they ruled out the shorter of the two orb orbital periods. Combining this with their findings from the Gaia satellite's geometric distance of 1,155 parsecs, they determined that the orbital period must be 25.75 years, or 25 years and 9 months, with an eccentricity of 0.78, a near-edge inclination of about 84 degrees, giving the total system mass of 56.5 solar masses. The team then used some standard astronomical computer code to disentangle the spectra of the two stars. This code relies on good astrometric data, which they had from their interferometry. Using it, they found orbital velocities of about 28 kilometers per second for the primary and 32 kilometers per second for the secondary. With this total known mass, they derived the masses of each star's 30 and 27 solar masses. Frost and her team then compared their disentangled spectra to atmospheric models using even more well-known stellar modeling software, and they found an effective temperature of about 37,000 Kelvin for the primary and 35,000 for the secondary. 
Well, here effective temperature means the temperature of the star's atmosphere that produced the spectral features. It may be that the actual temperature of the star has a different value, but stars have different opacities at different wavelengths, and different wavelengths of light come from different regions in the depths of the star's atmosphere. So, this temperature is a real temperature, but it can't characterize the entire star. The stellar model also showed that the primary has a higher surface gravity than the secondary, which indicates it's more compressed. Generally, for two main sequence stars of similar spectral classes, the one with a lower surface gravity is older. This is a result of the more extended shell burning in the core, which lifts the stellar envelope. Combining the temperature with the now known luminosity showed that the primary star is hotter and less evolved, i.e. younger, than the secondary. This Hertzsprung-Russell diagram shows the difference between the primary and secondary stars. The temperature is on the horizontal axis and the luminosity is on the vertical axis. The red dashed lines represent isochrones for the stars with an initial rotation of about 160 kilometers per second. The green dashed lines represent isochrones for stars with an initial rotation of about 500 kilometers per second. Isochrones are lines of equal age spanning a range of masses. The green solid lines are evolutionary tracks for the various initial masses computed at the standard galactic metallicity. The squares show the best fit atmospheric measurements with about one sigma error bars. The shaded areas give the allowed possibilities from the atmospheric simulations. What's important here is that the analysis shows that their ages look distinctly different, and this kind of study is de rigueur for stellar astrophysics. Another result from the modeling is that the secondary star's atmosphere is rich in nitrogen but low in carbon and oxygen, compared to standard O-type stars. But the primary star is also nitrogen rich. The primary also spins faster than the secondary, and magnetic fields in massive stars tend to slow the rotation. That's a thing called magnetic braking. The primary's fast rotation suggests the magnetic field that we're seeing hasn't had time to slow down the star yet. Finally, light curves from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, hint that the primary star's magnetic axis might not be aligned with its rotational axis. Now, the primary star, being the more massive one in the HD 148937 system, is expected to evolve faster. That's standard stellar astrophysics. However, when the team compared the luminosities and temperatures for their atmospheric analysis, they found it was younger than the secondary star. Using stellar evolution models, they found the magnetic primary was about 2.7 million years old, while the secondary star is about 4 million years old, if we ignore nitrogen. With the excess nitrogen taken into account, the secondary could be old, as old as 6.6 .6 million years old. No matter what, the secondary star is definitely appearing to be the older brother. This age difference of about 1.4 million years is pretty significant because O-type stars only live a few tens of millions of years on the main sequence. Therefore, the two stars had to have radically different histories. There are no nearby O stars or other massive star neighbors, so it's unlikely that different age stars captured each other. Both stars must have formed around the same time, but the primary must have experienced some kind of rejuvenation event that makes it appear younger. It can't be a close mass transfer because the secondary star would have to be on its way to becoming a giant or supergiant. Further, mass transfer event always circularize the orbits of the two stars, and their orbits are highly eccentric. The merger is probably a good guess. A merger can also explain the, the big nebula that surrounds the star. The nitrogen levels of the nebula are much higher than we'd expect from the secondary star's observed surface nitrogen enrichment if it came from the secondary. The nebula's enrichment of nitrogen is also located in its farthest regions. This amount of enrichment has to come from within some star. And Wolferiat stars do this. They shed their outer envelopes, exposing their cores, which then get blasted away through strong stellar winds. But Wolferiat stars are distinctly not main sequence stars. They're evolved stars, nearing their end. A nebula formed from the merger is expected to have a short lifespan. The team's observations show that the kinematic age of the nebula to be about 7,500 years. Magnetic breaking would take about a million years or a million and a half years to slow down the star, so it's plausible that the same event could have created both the nebula 
and the magnetic field of the star. All other scenarios that would create a bipolar nebula would need one or both stars to have moved off the main sequence, which doesn't fit the observations. The team then used hydrodynamical models, more computer models, to figure out the star's masses during a merger and how the resulting star rejuvenates. They found that two stars merging could explain not only the current mass of 30 solar masses for the magnetic primary star, but also why it appears younger than the secondary star. They found several models that fit the age discrepancy and the masses of both stars. And in every model, the total mass of the merging stars was about 35 solar masses. Somewhere between two and eight solar masses would have been lost during this merger. And this matches nicely with estimates of the nebula's mass, ranging from 1.6 to 12.6 solar masses. And to sum it all up, the European Southern Observatory astronomers think that HD 148937 started off as part of a more complex system, probably a triple star with a tight inner binary. That inner binary underwent a merger a few thousand years ago, creating a magnetic field in a new star and creating also the surrounding nebula. Their insights into the system bolster the idea that mergers are a significant source of magnetism in massive stars. This theory has been floating around for a while, but no strong evidence existed for it until these measurements. The predicted fraction of O stars that might go through mergers is about 8% of all existing O stars. This is pretty close to the 7% which is observed with O stars that have magnetic fields. This suggests that mergers are probably the main reason we see magnetism in O stars and stellar giants. This solves a long-standing astrophysics mystery. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. I give much greater detail about these kinds of stars in my video titled Module 7, Cosmic Calibration. Talk to you soon.